In some ways, I'd hate to view the sort of 60s with two over-rosy glasses, but I think the agenda was entirely set by Sid's writing. He was a great talent, but he was also bloody difficult. Sid's intelligence and wit are the things that I remember him by. Busking in saint Tropez with him, sitting in a tent late at night, reading banned books. My fond memories of him are not really related to the music. He was always laughing. He'd always had huge sparkle in his eyes. As a child, he was very attractive. And he was exceptionally <laughs> gifted. Always had loads and loads of friends. It was such fun. There were two Sids. There's the pre-acid and the post-acid. And the pre-acid, Sid was just the most wonderful, open, flamboyant guy. And clearly, we're all hoping to get better. And all desperately trying as hard as possible to keep him in the bank. We all loved him. <laughs> This is Arnold Lane by Pink Floyd. Written and sung by their singer and creative leader, Sid Barrett, in April 1967, it became their first British hit. A former art student, Barrett had left his native Cambridge for London's Camberwell Art College in the mid-1960s, and he was about to be propelled towards life as a pop star, a role that would not sit well with him at all. In this programme, we'll hear how Barrett tragically unravelled through the recollections of his former bandmates, including one of the last interviews with Pink Floyd's late keyboard player, Richard Wright. We'll explore how Barrett's drug-taking shattered his faculties and resulted in him leaving the group after only one album. But Barrett's shadow was to hang over Pink Floyd long after his departure and his self-imposed exile to the suburbs of Cambridge, where he spent the rest of his life in the orbit of his loving family. As rock musicians frantically expanded their horizons in the mid to late 1960s, Sid Barrett revelled in experimental music at its most out there. But he could also write brilliant pop songs, which made it into what was then known as the Hit Parade. Pink Floyd manager Peter Jenner. Sid, he was the lead singer, he wrote vast majority of the songs, he was the lead guitar player, he was absolutely the heart of the band. You know, he was the Lennon McCartney of the band. The slightly curious thing is... Pink Floyd drummer Nick Mason. I mean, we played absolutely anything we could learn, and what we had realised was that if you had original material, then that set the agenda, and this mix of styles that Sid had, you know, this rather curious, lyrical, wistful, folky thing, and then the very radical sort of interstellar overdrive, which was really just a sort of rather rough jam. That was like their pièce de la résistance at their gigs, was the instrumental version of Interstellar Overdrug. But with dynamics that were really quite original in, in those days of rock and roll. Keyboard player Richard Wright. The riff starts it off, came from Sid. All the rest of it, whatever night we were playing it, it would be different. And what I'd found interesting about them was what they did with, I suspect, one chord improvisations, which Sid and Rick really mainly led on, and the others just sort of kept going as they sort of doodled away. And that seemed to be very sort of trippy. Driving to the gigs, it was so noticeable that there were suddenly all these young people with lots of longer hair, and they all had bells on and the Afghan coats and all the, the sort of hippie armour. I was probably stoned at the time, but I remember going, my goodness me, what's going on here? We were a band that weren't afraid of taking risks. We didn't want to be your standard showbiz band. Sid just flowered writing the songs. A, he dug out his book of songs that he already had, but B, he just went into a, a writing frenzy, which was extraordinary. Of course, we wanted to be successful and popular, and Sid particularly wanted to be a pop star, but he wanted to do it in his own way. With a cult following building up around Pink Floyd's fascinating music and light shows and Arnold Lane a hit record, Barrett, as frontman, writer and singer, was in demand. He was also surrounded by a new crowd of dubious friends 
taking large amounts of mind-altering drugs at his Cromwell Road flat in West London. So, even at this early stage of his musical progress, Sid was causing the other members of Pink Floyd cause for concern. People have different opinions, but I think Sid was with a group of people who firmly believed, take loads of acid and you'll see the truth and all that stuff. I believe they were basically spiking him, and I think that's the main reason for his mental instability. Pink Floyd's friend and later guitarist, David Gilmour. Sid's magnetic character did attract a lot of people to him who were frankly not his equal in any way at all and did rather encourage him and provide him with lots of drugs. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I can't really say what LSD specifically does or what it did to Sid or what it exacerbated in Sid. Because we were very dependent on him. By this time, you see, he was undergoing all this sort of stress of coming to terms with fame. So there was an enormous pressure for, like, interviews and people recognising him in the street. Sid, what's it all about? What does it mean? And I think he was just overwhelmed by it. As Barrett grappled with the demands of his escalating fame, he also had to cope, as chief songwriter with the recording of Pink Floyd's debut album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, released in August 1967. By this time, the group had become figureheads of London's flowering counterculture. So, as well as trudging around the British ballroom circuit as promising pop stars, they also played rather more exotic engagements, like the all-night benefit show The 14-Hour Technicolor Dream at London's Alexandra Palace. For us, it was not a particularly great evening. By the time we got to the Technicolor Dream, we actually had done another show in Holland that same night. So we were not on our very best form. And I think Sid was beginning by then to show signs of wear and tear. By this time, Sid had lost it. I don't think he even realised where he was. And it was trying to find different ways of coping with what was clearly become a very difficult position for them, because it would be things like Is he going to turn up to go to the gig? You know, what songs is he going to sing? Because of mounting concerns about his erratic behaviour, Sid was moved away from his Cromwell Road circle of friends into a flat in Richmond with band member Richard Wright. All of us love Sid. Clearly, we're all hoping he'd get better and all desperately trying as hard as possible to keep him in the band. Word of his condition had reached the Barrett family in Cambridge and Sid's mother was especially concerned. Sister Rosemary. She was very worried, very worried. But what could she do? She did try and get him to see doctors and this sort of thing. But to no avail, I think, because he knew that what he was doing was wrong. But it was accepted in his world to be involved in drugs and therefore he withdrew much more from Cambridge and from the family. There were new pressures on Sid, not least because Pink Floyd's record label, EMI, wanted a new single. Manager Peter Jenner. Up to and including recording See Emily playing, he may have been different, but it was still one was working with him in, in a way which was reasonably coherent. I think it became through that next summer, 67, that it became harder. David Gilmore paid a visit to the See Emily play recording sessions. Well, he, was, he had a very strange look on his face when I got there. They were working away, and we did talk, but he had, did have this very strange, starey-eyed look, which um, was not friendly. There was something troubling him. He didn't look like the same person. And uh, on that particular day, I saw a sign of what was going to come. In the same way that you don't notice when your children growing up, I didn't notice that. It's very hard to see that day-to-day change. And I think Dave, I'm sure his observation is absolutely correct. He was tipping at that point, definitely in a strange mental place, and was struggling Maybe this was something that went in waves and um, that was a particularly bad moment. But I'm hey, they were making C. Emily play. <laughs> it doesn't sound like there's too much of a problem. Soon after dark, Emily cries. Oh. Gazing through trees in sorrow, hardly a sound till tomorrow. Sid 
they gave the band a bit of glamour, if you like. He was the charismatic person of the band. Out of all of us, he was the star. My memory of Sid is that it was a very sudden thing when he went over the edge. See Emily Play reached the top ten in July 1967, and that month Pink Floyd would make three appearances on top of the Pops. But on one occasion, Sid failed to appear at the TV studio. We turned up to the BBC and they couldn't find Sid. Andrew King and Peter Jenner eventually found him and came back and said, something terrible has happened. He's like a zombie. The shock of seeing him. Such a change. He stopped enjoying it. Drummer Nick Mason again. He just had lost interest in it. And I said, actually underwent a sort of conscience crisis that this wasn't art. It was becoming so commercial with television and record sales. And he had been an art student and still painted and had a fairly rigorous view of how one should behave as an artist. And I think that just meant this was not really what he wanted to do. Pink Floyd and their management were at a loss to know how to cope with their indifferent leader. These days, a similar case would doubtless lead to time out from the commercial treadmill and a spell in a renowned treatment facility like the Priory. But these were much more innocent and more accelerated times, and it was decided that what Sid needed was a fortnight in the sun. So Barrett was sent on a summer holiday to the Spanish island of Formentera with Richard Wright. The idea was, let's get Sid out of London, away from acid away from all his friends, who treated him like a god. I mean, they worshipped him. And uh, it was clearly much more serious than we thought it was, because he couldn't respond, he couldn't communicate, he couldn't do anything in form and terror. I think he had nightmares, I mean, real living nightmares, trying to climb up walls. And and the biggest change for me, his eyes. He's had so much life in him, and then his eyes just went dead. I mean, we're all hoping that this rest and to get away... He was just basically burnt out and just needed a complete break, but it clearly was much more serious than that. It was very scary, very upsetting. Richard, Sid and their girlfriends returned to the UK. Despite his deterioration, Barrett fronted Pink Floyd through another round of dates through September and October. Then, in November 1967, they began their first concerts in America. We were so determined to carry on that we probably all pretended that he was a bit better because actually Sid was the writer, he was the front man. The last thing we needed was to lose Sid. His behaviour before the American tour was getting a bit tricky, but it got really bad in America. But he had to get pretty sort of difficult before we considered doing it without him. And, you know, I think that perhaps is the regret that we dragged him along for longer than we ever should have done. When he came back from America, that had a real shocking effect. It was after that that we started getting worried about his mental health. But before they could even begin to sort out their crumbling frontman, Pink Floyd joined a three-week British tour with the Jimi Hendrix experience. And it was all very upsetting, and of course it was all upsetting our business, because it meant we were becoming quite unreliable, you know, on that famous Hendrix tour, you know, would he be there for the bus? The tour was relatively simple. There was no room for doing anything other than playing the three songs and getting off again. When he didn't turn up, that was one big problem. On one or two gigs, we had David O'List from the Nice had to do the guitar playing. It was such a hectic, busy time. There were times when it was impossible for him to play, and there were other times when, mm, yeah, he can, he's singing, he's playing. There came a point where what was avant-garde became a bit disturbing, and when it was playing the same note all the way through, it became clearly a bit weird. None of us had any experience of what was going on. It was, you know, we, we had no idea how to cope with it. Virtually every night, all of us standing backstage waiting for Hendrix to come on. That was an amazing tour, actually, but that was the end. This tour, when we just knew Sid just couldn't do it. To relieve some of the pressure on Sid, a decision was taken. For live performances, another guitarist would join the band, freeing Barrett to do whatever he liked. Pink Floyd's choice was Sid's former busking partner and friend, David Gilmore. Uh, Yeah, the idea became that I would be there as well and sing and play, and Sid would be there and sing and play if he felt like it. Very hard to know now how Sid perceived it, or even how well thought out it was. Things changed when David joined the band. I mean, he was recruited to try and play Sid stuff, but David also brought in his unique style into the band. As the days went on, these ideas got modified and to the point where Sid really just stood there for a couple of gigs and didn't really do anything, and then... It was all decided by the band, with David now in the band, that we'll go without Sid. And I was living with Sid in Richmond, trying to take care of him, 
I had the horrible thing of having to say to Sid, Sid, I'm just going out to get some cigarettes. Because if I said we're going off to do a gig, whatever state he was in, he would come. And so I had to lie to him, if you like. So I'm just popping out and then went off and did the gig and came back and he said, have you got the cigarettes yet? And this was like four hours later. (laughs) It was strange. So I feel a bit bad about that. We didn't pick Sid up and he didn't come to gigs anymore and we kind of hoped that he would give us lots more great songs and that everyone would be happy. On April the 6th, 1968, Sid Barrett announced his departure from the group. Free of his commitment to Pink Floyd, Sid spent a short time in hospital in the spring of 1968. Around this time, the Scottish psychiatrist R.D. Lang was gaining a reputation as an expert in psychosis and an advocate of what was called anti-psychiatry. And Peter Jenner contacted him. It seemed to me he was the obvious person to call and try and see if we could work it out. And there was a whole question started coming up of dealing with the issue. Was that who is mad, the madman or, or the people around who are saying he's mad? You know, because in a way Lang was saying you should take people of what they say is what they mean. Efforts were made by a group of friends and by us in the band. But frankly, we didn't put enough effort into it. Um, we were busy. Basically, I think we thought that once he's gone, he's gone. It is a different world today. Unfortunately, at the time and um, within the circle of people who were around him, we just didn't know enough about it. I don't blame them. Sid's sister, Rosemary. But I think they did try to help him. I remember hearing that that they did take him to a psychiatric hospital. They sort of took him and dumped him on the doorstep, but of course he, he just left. But he was terribly stubborn, always about everything. So... I don't blame them at all. So was Rosemary's brother ever diagnosed with any kind of mental disorder? No, he never was diagnosed with anything. Personality disorder just about summed it up. What we've got is a very eccentric, very creative brain affected severely by huge doses of LSD. You're going to end up with chaos, and chaos was what ensued. Now out of Pink Floyd, Sid slept on friends' floors through the autumn of 1968. David Gilmore. We were in touch all the time. He was sleeping in my flat um, in Victoria. Yes, I mean, we were still spending a fair bit of time together. Yes, and he then moved in with Dougie Fields in Earl's Court Square, and I got a flat in Old Brompton Road. I think it was a complete coincidence that we happened to live where I could look out of my kitchen into his kitchen. Very strange, really. As David and Sid waved to each other from their kitchen tables, Barrett decided to record again. In April 1969, he returned to Abbey Road to record his solo album, The Mad Cat Laughs, and the following year he released another album, titled Barrett. Both failed to make an impression on the UK album charts, although devotees of Sid still adore them. I just worry about people who get so excited about how great those albums are. I'm not worried about it. I, I just sort of think, that's not the real Sid. Now, what am I, who am I to say that? Maybe that's just my problem, not theirs. I could never listen to Madcap Laughs or the other one, Barrett. I could never listen to those records because it was like a shadow of what I'd known. And this is sort of trying to find the bits of gold dust in the pan, which you're sort of wa- washing out, and then trying to stick them together and turn them into a nugget. Whereas what he was doing back with the Floyd, he was producing the Nuggets. By the end of 1970, Barrett had evidently had enough of London. Not for the first time, he headed home for Cambridge and the warm security of his mother Winifred's house. Sister Rosemary again. To me, he was somebody who I'd lost at that time. It was a very bad time for him. He did some artwork. It, he did a huge canvas, about six, seven foot in width, and it was all black. And in the bottom corner, about an inch by an inch, there was a little red square. And I remember looking at that and thinking, you know, he's in trouble. So he came home to stay with Mum. And it was a bad time. Um, he was quite distressed for a long time. Sid spent 1971 well away from public attention. But the following year, he ventured once more on stage with a new band called Stars. They managed five fairly shambolic gigs, the last of which came on February the 24th, 1972, the final time Sid Barrett was seen by a paying audience. Meanwhile, in London, Pink Floyd performed at the Rainbow Theatre, showcasing a new song cycle called Dark Side of the Moon, subtitled A Piece for Assorted Lunatics. It would soon lift the group into superstardom. 
David Gilmore. Dark Side of the Moon is, a, is about the tendency towards madness that is um, brought upon one by the pressures of life. And um, obviously, to me, Dark Side of the Moon is definitely very, very influenced by um, Sid's condition. Sid Barrett still cast a shadow over his former colleagues. And in the summer of 1975, as Pink Floyd worked on their follow-up to Dark Side of the Moon, one song in particular became very significant. Shine on You Crazy Diamond was written about Sid. It all came out of a haunting little guitar phrase that fell out of my guitar one day, and um, that did something to Roger. That guitar moved something in Roger, and uh, it started this whole process off that became Shine On You Crazy Diamond, which was specifically about Sid and his problems. And so to a truly mind-boggling episode. On the 5th of June 1975, Barrett turned up at Abbey Road Studios and paid a visit to his former bandmates. He came out of the blue. Drummer Nick Mason again. I've never heard anyone say, oh, I said to Sid, why don't you drop in? Because I don't think anyone had seen him for a, a while. I think it was variable as to whether people knew who he was or not. I certainly didn't recognise him straight away. I think everyone has a sort of odd flashes of that whole thing. Didn't recognise him. So I sat down next to Roger and I said, is that one of your friends? He said, no. And he wouldn't tell me. So I kept on looking and I couldn't, I didn't get it for about ten minutes. And then he said, that's Sid. And it just, I just, so shocked. It's a strange thing. But yeah, he was there and it did take a while before one of us said, bloody hell, that's Sid. But it's spooky. Because by this time he was about 18 stone because I think he was on cortisone, shaved off all his body hair, including eyebrows, and all he did was occasionally jump up and sit down again. About seven years since he'd left the band. We're all very, very shocked and shaken by it, I have to say. But it was unique, because we were actually recording the song dedicated to him, Shine On Your Crazy Diamond, when he came in. Pure coincidence. There's no way he would have known we're doing that. Remember when... The summer of 1975 was the last time the members of Pink Floyd saw Sid Barrett. At that point, he finally left London for good after a period of eight years. His sister, Rosemary. So he came home to stay with Mum. He was quite distressed for a long time. But there, we're talking years and years and years, aren't we? Probably ten years plus of chaos. He eventually, after some years, sorted himself out and he got himself a life with me and my mother. Throughout the 1980s, Sid lived a secluded life. He was occasionally seen around Cambridge, the odd photograph of him appeared in the tabloid papers, and he continued to paint and draw. But he never pursued music again. Things changed in 1991, when his mother died and Sid became the responsibility of his sister. I didn't see him every day. I'd see him two or three times a week. He needed a lot of support in lots of ways, really, to learn how to live. He'd forgotten. You get up, you have breakfast, you go shopping, you come back, you have lunch. The normal routine of a day, it had never really featured in his life. It was a worry. It was a worry. I, I did perhaps take it too seriously, but I did love him perhaps too much. <laughs> so he learnt slowly, but he was content. And that was what I strived for, for him, was contentment. And I think, I think he achieved it. Sid Barrett died on July the 7th, 2006, due to complications relating to diabetes. He was 60. Once again, his image stared anxiously from magazines, newspapers and TV news reports, as his myth was retold. Sid unexpectedly received an obituary in The Sun, and the front cover of the NME declared him the original punk rocker. 
Given how long it had been since he was any kind of public figure, his family were taken aback. Very surprised. After 30 years of being out of the limelight, I thought there would probably be no reaction. Pleased, really. Yeah, pleased for him, although he would hate it. <laughs> he wanted to make his mark in life, and I think he did. A very unusual way, and that's, that, that would suit him. I don't know. He was just such an amazingly unusual person. He was just so different and so original. And we need people like him. Five years after his death, and despite the small quantity of music he actually recorded, Sid Barrett remains a potent influence on modern musicians. The best of his music still shows how to combine a dazzlingly experimental attitude with accomplished songwriting. And his story of a creative light burning so brightly before chemical excess led to real tragedy will always exert a pull, however misplaced, on a certain kind of adolescent romantic. Moreover, one thing is beyond doubt, that it's impossible to understand the saga of Pink Floyd without reference to the brilliant yet tragic figure who defined their beginnings. So, to finish, over to those who saw both sides of Sid Barrett, Richard Wright, David Gilmore and Nick Mason. Sid, in a way, was the catalyst who produced Pink Floyd, so that however talented Roger or David or Rick are, that um, Sid actually deserves to take some credit for all of the best things that we've done since. I think without Sid, there probably would not have been the dark side of the moon, there probably wouldn't have even been the wall. And things that people still look fondly on today, like Bike and Arnold Lane, and things like that. Sid occupied nether regions of all our minds at various times. I mean, he was a brilliant, funny, intelligent, lovely chap. To see that whole thing disappear is a very troubling and very sad thing, not only for people like me who knew him fairly well, but obviously has that same thing for thousands of people who loved his work. He was more than the product of his time. Sid was unique. And someone who's unique will write what they want and won't write what they feel they should write because he had a very sort of individualistic way of living and looking at life. How I wish, how I wish you were here We're just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl Year after year Running over the same old ground What have we found? The Twilight World of Sid Barrett was presented and co-written by me, John Harris, and was a sugar production for BBC Radio 4.